Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from dark Miami. It's 3 in the morning here, but and it's a little later in Apollo 11, I believe, 11 or 12. Uh, we're, uh, it gives me great honor to start this uh, online conference for the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. And today we have the honor of having a noted neurosurgeon, Ipe Cherian, MD. Uh, he's originally from India, but he's now in Nepal. Uh, and I'll introduce him after we introduce the guests. First, we'll start with uh, the medical students. Let's start with Garab. Hello, Garab. Can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, sir. Yeah I'm, uh, yeah, I'm honored to be a part of this. Uh, and who, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Who are you? Yeah, I'm Gaurav, but uh, I'm studying uh, third year uh, MBBS in College of Medical Sciences, and I'm a student of Dr. Hypatirian. Okay, welcome. Javeen? Sir, uh, sir I'm, I had just completed my fourth year medical uh, MBBS exam from Kathmandu Medical College. Welcome. And a, a surprise guest, Roberto. Good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning. Hey, Good Roberto. <laughs> so good to see you, Roberto. Hey, how are you? In my, in my country, it's 4 a.m. Wow. And in my house, um, everybody are sleeping. <laughs> a typical, typical neurosurgeon hours. Good, good morning, Roberto. Simon. Hello everyone. Good it's uh, it, good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, Ipe, it's all yours. Yeah. So, uh, Gaurav and Jeevan, in case you don't know, Roberto. Roberto is a world famous vascular surgeon from Argentina. He comes for all the courses. He's a is a very big guy in the international circles. So let me start off with uh, the surgical technique of such nostrum. So. Uh, I'm going to screen share, John. Okay. Can you? Uh, not, not yet. There you go. See the there, you go. there you go. Perfect. Yes. So we we'll be talking about the surgical technique of cystinostomy. Now, uh, a lot of people already know all over the world what is cystinostomy. It is a uh, alternate that we've developed over the last 10 years uh, for uh, decompressive hemicrinectomy. We believe that although trauma is a huge load of uh, patients in all over the third world, uh, the so-called third world, and even in the developed uh, countries now, uh, microsurgery has never been practiced in trauma till the last 10 years. We started when we started doing it. So uh, now the opinion of the world is changing, but we're trying to tell you how we do the cystinostomy. So what is the aim of uh, this surgery? So number one would be to introduce microsurgery to trauma. Number two, instead of going on top, that's what decompressive hemicrinectomy does, instead of going on top, we go to the base. And then open the cisterns in a tight break. This is something what aneurysm surgeons already do. So we're trying to open the cisterns in a tight break. Now, the last aim of this would be, uh, you know, the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, that it is a curve. So I'm going to go to my, uh, I'm going to go to the, my sketchbook. I love drawings. And this is a platform which allows me to draw. It's beautiful. So let's go to the sketchbook pro. Now what I was talking to you about is, uh, I'm just going to show you that. You know, the brain is, oh, I'm sorry, uh, one second. The brain is something like that. Now, uh, to go in this trajectory in the base and get things there, you need to eliminate the things sitting here. So that is what you need to eliminate. You need to eliminate things sitting there. So how do you do that? The thing sitting there is the anticlinoid. 
So if you need to go down the base to something in the center, you need to take out the anticline out. How we do that will be dealt with in another talk. Um, I'm sure as a skull base surgeon, Roberto does this very routinely. Uh, I'm trying to be as simple as possible because our uh, uh, guests are going to be mostly medical students. So instead of uh, trying and uh, uh, telling something which goes over their heads, I'm just telling this in a very simple way and I hope these guys are understanding it. So uh, now let us start off with the surgical technique of cystinostomy. I'm going into uh, a video. So I'm going to show you a back case of cystinostomy. So how it starts and how it ends. Okay. okay. So yeah, that is a case where uh, it's a very, very bad, big sub acute subdural. Most of these cases undergo uh, decompressive hemicranectomy. Here I'm just opening a 2.5 centimeter incision there and I'm just going in. Uh, I opened the interoptic and optical carotid and then I opened, I'm opening the, the dura. Once I open the dura, I'm going to take out the acute subdural there which gives me a little bit more space. And then I go and I'll go and open the optical carotid and the interoptic and the membrane of relicus. But after the cystinostomy, you see, I put the drain in the prepondine cistern there. You see how how lax is the brain there? That's what I wanted to show you. So this is an ideal case. Now let us look at a case which is pretty bad, which means uh, you're going to look at a case where the brain's going to just come out. A lot of people ask me, or oh, you can do this in an ideal case, but what about this? See this. So you will see how tight this brain is. You can see the brain coming out there. That's a <laughs> that's a brain coming out there. You can see that. How bad is that? Now you go into the optic. Uh, now one thing I wanted to always show people is that how the CSF swells. Uh, I mean, the CSF starts swelling up. And in the scan of this patient, you wouldn't see any cisterns here because this, the cisterns almost have disappeared. Now, you can clearly see the CSF welling up there. Once you take out that CSF, it will well up again. And you see, this incision is still again 2.5 centimeter. You can see the, how the brain is pulsating. And no decompressive, just a 2.5 centimeter small opening right down. and. Uh, that's it. So that is how cystinostomy starts and ends. Now let's go to uh, an, uh, the anatomy of cystinostomy. I mean, uh, th what the next video that I wanted to show you is about the anatomy of cystinostomy. So now orient people, orienting people, that is a frontal lobe. That's a temporal lobe. You have the optic nerve there. You have the carotid there. It's just like for any aneurysm surgery. So we removed the subdural, and we just uh, going in and uh, uh, doing the cystinostomy. Interoptic and optical carotid windows are open, so you can see on this side laminar terminalis will be there. So I'm with my left hand. I'm just cutting the mem membrane of Lilliquest. Uh, this exactly is not membrane of Lilliquest. This is the uh, this is the arachnoid around the carotid, which uh, which is an extension of the cilium. So I'm, I'm just cutting that. Once I cut that, deeper to that, I'll find the membrane of nucleus between the carotid and the third nerve, and also between the optic nerve and the carotid. So I have I have taken that off. And in this window, I'll get the posterior communicating and the anterior choroidal here. And this window, you are already seeing the basilar. The basilar artery is being seen. That is a basilar artery. That is a superior cerebellar artery. And you can see the P1 there, the P1 there. That's a basilar trunk. That's a basilar top. And this is through the optical character window. You see, this optical character window is about, that is the A1. You will see the A comb here. So 
Uh, this is the technique. This is the surgical anatomy. So the things that you actually see is what I, I was just showing you. Right. So uh, usually this is how. I mean, you, this is how you're going to do a decompressive. You're going to put your head like that, and you're going to extend the head a bit. So it would be just like doing any aneurysm surgery. So once you extend that head, and once you turn it 30 degree, after you decompress your hemicraniectomy, then things are very easy. You go into the base. After you decompress your hemicraniectomy for about two minutes, you have a time when the brain is lax. And during that time, you follow the frontal base, go into the base, retract, a little, retract it a little bit, and then your optical carotid system and your interoptic system is going to be opened. And immediately, you will see the brain, uh, the pressure coming down. And after that, as you attain more and more confidence, you can go into the, in the, um, in, into the optical carotid window, open the membrane of the lucus. For somebody as accomplished that, uh, as uh, Roberto, I mean, he wouldn't need to wait and do this because he already does this for aneurysms and skull-based tumors. So he doesn't have to wait. But for a guy who's just start, starting it off, they would need to do a decompressive first, go to the base, open the interoptic optical carotid, and after maybe 50 or 100 cases, then they can uh, go ahead and open the membrane of Liliquest and see the basilar and put in a drain into the prepondine system. So if you do that, I'm not telling this is a miracle. It wouldn't work for infarcted brains. But for most of the acute subdurals that you're doing a decompressive hemicranic to me, this would work. I mean, I, I'm sure of that. We've been doing it for 10 years now. We've got more than 1,500 patients. It would work. So that is the most simple way of doing a systemostomy. Do a decompressive, extend the head, turn the head 30 degree, go with a retractor in, open the inter interoptic optical carotid, let out the CSF, and if the brain is lax, you can put your bone flap back as a free flap. If you are not confident, you, I mean, you keep the bone flap out, and that would be a decompressive hemicranectomy plus systemostomy. So this is what I tell everybody. And then now, as the tougher and tougher cases come, uh, the one I was showing you the other day, uh, the, first, the first video which I showed you was about uh, cystinostomy which, where uh, the brain is just coming out. So how do you get into the base for that kind of a case? There, you need skull base. That's where you need skull base. So uh, what are the skull base techniques which will help you to get into the supracellar system? So the skull base technique, which specifically helps you to get into the uh, into supracellar system, uh, we call it the modified Dollings. So Winko Dolling uh, was a skull base pioneer who devised, uh, whose principle was bone, bone removal will help in less retraction. So what we did was we followed that principle. So uh, as I showed you, the anterior was removed. We did a transcavernous dissection, and we were able to directly get into the, instead of uh, retracting the brain, we were directly able to get into the suprasella system and release CSF. So uh, all these techniques are going to be discussed in the videos later on. So right now, I want this to be uh, a user-friendly and a completely interactive uh, session. This is what I always miss when I when I have uh, people when who, where I'm talking to. You get only five minutes for discussion. That's just not enough because this is a completely radical, controversial, and a very new technique. So I would right now I'll stop at this point. And whenever you have questions, I'm going to show you videos and probably sketches. I'll, I'm I'm going to ask you to ask me questions, starting with Roberto. Roberto. Hello, Roberto. Hello, Do you have questions, Pride? Yeah, Roberto is here. Uh, Roberto, I, I was wanting to ask if Roberto is already an accomplished skull base surgeon. I wanted to ask his opinion, number one. I wanted to ask uh, whether he is following this. If he is not, what are the difficulties he would think that? I mean, obviously, he's a very experienced campaigner there. So he's a veteran. So I would ask him what, what he thinks would be uh, good about this, what he thinks would be bad about this. I would like to hear both. Okay. okay. He, he, he Hello? Yes, yes. 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 Can you hear you, Roberto. Are you, are you to me? 
Yes. I listen to you, Robert. Yes. Um, I think it's very interesting this. Um, we are um, beginning to, we are starting to, to do this kind of, this compressive uh, in, in our country. Uh, but I, I have uh, an ask for you. Uh, what happens if you use um, cisternostomy more uh, and um, discompressive craniectomy? I, I know you, yes, together. I, I, I know you don't use this. Um, uh, could you explain um, um, which is the reason you prefer only cisternostomy and, and no together uh, cisternostomy and craniectomy, please? Yes, yes. Roberto, that's a very, very, uh, very good question. In fact, I should admit to you that I started off with a decompressive hemicranectomy, and then I started for almost 300 cases, I did decompressive plus cystinostomy. So that is how I started off. For 284 cases, almost 300 cases, I did decompressive, and then I opened the interoptic and optical carotid, and I left the flap at that. I left, I mean, I left the bone flap out. So it was a decompressive hemicranectomy plus cystinostomy. So exactly what you're asking was what, what, what I was doing six, seven years back. And then I understood that that requirement is only for a very small number of uh, cases where there is infarction or there's a long time has passed or the patient's GCS is pretty poor. In that case, I still use decompressive plus cystinostomy. But otherwise, if it is an acute subdural, or if there is just a contusion, I would be happy uh, doing a cystinostomy alone. I mean, I'm sure uh, once you started doing the uh, decompressive plus cystinostomy, you would also appreciate once the cisterns are open and the brain is lax, you wouldn't want to leave the bone flap out. You would want to keep the bone flap back in if the brain is quite lax. So then it becomes a cystinostomy. It, uh, once you keep the bone flap back, your status of decompressive hemicranectomy is gone, so you are you are doing only a cystinostomy. I hope I answered your question, Roberto. Okay, is 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 so I understand the, this, but um, to to Janir is uh, I think we can convince um, them to use uh, cystinostomy. Together with uh, this, the compressive craniectomy as a yes. first step, as the yes, first yes, step, uh, you're because right. they don't believe in in cisternostomy only uh, how the, the 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 only procedure, no? But uh, I I like very very much your work and I believe in this. Um, and we are starting to, to do the, this, this kind of cisternostomy. Uh, and it's very good for the training in general neurosurgeon uh, to operate the, the trauma and, and, and they can see the, the basilar artery, open the, cister, the, the, the cisterna, um, and, and the trauma is uh, more and more frequently around the world. Uh, each day, and I think it's uh, very, very important to know the cisternostomy surgery. And uh, congratulations for your work, Ripe. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Robert. Yeah, I have a comment. Uh, I, you know, I know that you're well known in India for the cisternoscopy, and I know that surgical resident, neurosurgical residents, come up to Nepal to train with you. Uh, would you say is is a, a fairly common procedure in India uh, for for brain, uh, traumatic brain injury? Uh, well, I wouldn't say fairly common because India has got uh, over ten thousand neurosurgeons, yeah. but there are at least thirty centers all over the world, and uh, and that's fast increasing very fast because all the senior guys now, uh, a lot of my friends, they're doing uh, cystinostomy. I've got people doing it in Europe. I mean, uh, Roy, if he's participating, I'll ask him to participate. So I will ask him to uh, tell his experience in Switzerland. Then we have Nikolai P doing it in uh, uh, in Belfast. We have a lot of Chinese neurosurgeons doing it. 
and in All India Institute, uh, which is one of the leading institutes, they are starting it. So we have a lot of people, in fact, uh, doing systemostomy in India too. But I wouldn't say it's fairly common because uh, any new technique which is radical would take many years to establish. As Roberto said, young neurosurgeons just don't believe that systemostomy alone can uh, sort out this severe head injury because in our head we have a concept that severe head injury is the most uh, the, the worst thing that can happen to a neurosurgeon. So that is because we do this only as residents and uh, uh, once we finish our residency and once we become a senior consultant we hardly do trauma but that memory that uh, that the severe head injury was very bad that sticks in our mind and so whenever we hear a severe head injury we, we go oh like that. So I understand when Roberto says that uh, uh, young neurosurgeons wouldn't believe uh, that uh, you know, just cystinostomy alone couldn't, could not handle. And plus, it's a very, very technically, technically difficult surgery. I'm not uh, denying the fact that uh, for a young neurosurgeon, if I, if I say straight away go into the system and see the basilar, it's not easy. It's a technically very, very difficult surgery. So uh, I think the one of the best ways to start off would be to start off with just uh, uh, decompressive hemicranectomy, going into the base, learning to get into the base without really traumatizing the brain without really causing a rupture of arteries, without really hurting the optic nerve. And learning to do that will be the first step. And then you can, once you are into the system, that's a completely different world. I mean, once you're under the microscope, it's a very, very fine dissection, completely different, extreme. I mean, just diff opposite to what you do in trauma. In trauma, you take a monopolar and cut off frontal lobe, or you suck out something, you suck out uh, some lobe. I mean, it's very traumatic. But on the other hand, once you get into the cisterns in a cisternostomy, the dissection is going to be extremely fine. It's almost like vascular surgery. So uh, it's a paradigm shift. It's not easy for, um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's fair for uh, young neurosurgeons to start it off straight off. So I would, I would hope that uh, uh, senior neurosurgeons are involved, like uh, Roberto, who's doing skull base, vascular. They're involved and they are going to guide these, patient, guide these people first and then they can go ahead and, uh, you know, do it. Uh, you know, uh, if you're very well traveled and you go to many conferences, do you find a lot of neurosurgeons are asking you questions about this procedure and wanting to know uh, your results and procedure, etc.? Yes, yes. Um, well, wherever I go, uh, you know, in the first uh, few years, I used to be an entertainer, which means... Uh, People used to say, ah, this guy, this astronostomy guy is come. Yeah. So people used to laugh at it. So I remember people sitting and laughing in the front row when I used to say that astronostomy alone can, uh, you know, relieve the tension. And at that time, I didn't have good operative videos as well. So it was difficult. Uh, but as the years passed by, then I started to confuse them, you know. Uh, uh, then people started thinking, would this work? Would this actually work? So that was what they were thinking. But as uh, now, as time is going on, there are people who have started trying it out, and then um, a fair percentage of them are finding good results with it. So they are standing up and saying that, yeah, this works. This guy is not saying some uh, bunkum. He's not saying uh, complete nonsense. So it, it actually works. So we are finding a lot of young guys and senior guys also interested. Um, so the response is changing over the last uh, 10 years I would I must say that it has really changed mm -hmm. so Europe and United States when I travel there there are in fact there's a guy called Lonoff Alexander who's in the United States and who's, who's doing it um, so a lot of people do believe in it but then you know uh, there are some uh, dictums in, 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 in Europe and United States where you just cannot get past it and do something completely new it's impossible for them to do it but there's a lot of guys who come and say that, yeah, I mean, we, we believe that it would work and it would be the future. But we're not starting it right now because there are some limitations. Okay. So, uh, so yes, there's a lot of questions. I mean, a uh, uh, lot of questions, a lot of ridicule, a lot of criticism, a lot of support. So it's a mix of back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Simon, uh, any questions? Yes, yes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cherry. This is fantastic to see this. Um, I, as a medical student, I have a chance to uh, look at many uh, uh, CTs, MRIs. I'm getting better at recognizing MRIs, for example, but I have no experience actually looking inside a brain. So to see a surgery 
uh, the anatomy just looks very confusing to me. Uh, you pointed out certain structures I recognize and remember from my, my books or classes or looking on MRIs, but I wonder, you, you talked about confidence in neurosurgery. What is the difference between a confident and a non-confident neurosurgeon and how is it, what makes somebody confident, I mean, other than experience? Yeah, I mean, Simon, I would say this is like any other art. Say, for example, if you are, uh, if you're used to riding cars at uh, 200 kilometers plus, um, if you are in the club of regularly driving cars, say, for example, an F1 driver, he drives at uh, 300 to 400 kilometers an hour. Now, if you are suddenly put in that driver's seat, you're going to find things very confusing because uh, the rate at which the car goes is a completely new world for you. Yeah. Uh, so you're going to be confused and you're not going to be confident. You're not going to take the corners in the right way. You're going to crash. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is exactly the difference. Neurosurgery, like any other art or any other skill, it's a stepwise process. Mm -hmm. So uh, for example, in a ruptured ACOM aneurysm, anterior communicating aneurysm, uh, if a neurosurgical resident is asked to operate, he's going to make a mess out of it because uh, it's a very tight brain. You cannot retract too much. Uh, and it, it's, it's pretty difficult. It makes life difficult. You don't know where the aneurysm is going to rupture. It's already ruptured. It's sitting there. You're going to go in there. But a master who's done this many times, it's not a big problem for him. An ACOM aneurysm, even if it ruptures in surgery, it's not a big problem for him. I see. But... It is the same thing, you know, a neurosurgical resident who cannot do an ACOM aneurysm, cannot even think of doing a cystronostomy. It's the same thing. It's the same type brain. Yeah. And uh, the easiest thing is to open a large flap and uh, take out the bone and uh, open the dura and allow it to swell and just come out. Would we do that for an ACOM aneurysm? Never. We, mm -hmm. we wouldn't do that. So I'm just applying uh, what is microsurgical principles followed in vascular and skull base into trauma. That's what yes. I'm doing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ipe. Yes, Robert. Yes. Um, yes. I think it took uh, many years to accept the, the compressive craniectomy for, for trauma. Hmm? Mm -hmm. It took many years. The people say the, the, the compressive craniotomy um, is not useful for trauma for long, long time. Okay? Yes, yes. I think uh, to change it now uh, will be very difficult. Mm? I, uh, I believe in, in your concept. Uh, I, I agree with your concept, but I think uh, to the neurosurgeon uh, will be very difficult to change uh, one kind of surgery for an, for another. Um, and, and perhaps the cisternostomy um, to, to know cisternostomy uh, will be necessary um, a learning cure. Okay? Absolutely. Um, uh, is uh, for that I um, I am treating in, in my country to to preconize to to make the cisternostomy as a, a complement of the compressive craniectomy uh, together and and the, the the young neurosurgeons are learning to do the the compressive craniectomy, uh, um, and we are uh, doing to the, the we are doing our first steps in cisternostomy. Mm? That uh, how you said is not easy. It's not easy because the brain is reeling, the the, the blood, the blood. Uh, but we are uh, starting to do the cisternostomy as a, a complement of uh, the compressive craniectomy. I, I don't know if, if this is the, the best manner, the best way, but, but we are uh, uh, starting to, to do this here. Hmm. So, Roberto, what you said is absolutely right. I completely agree with you. Uh, the only thing 
I mean, and I told you, I, I did this first. I mean, initially when uh, I, we started systemostomy, I told you over 300 cases, around 300 cases we have done with decompressive hemicranitum. And in fact, after that also, I used to take out a large chunk of temporal bone because there were many times I had to go back into the theater and take out the bone flap. So um, it is a long journey. So it is not easy to start. I mean, if I, somebody is already doing decompressive, if I say, no, no, don't, don't do decompressive, do cystinostomy, it is, it's almost stupid. If I say that, it is stupid. So the right way to go about is your way. So you do decompressive and plus cystinostomy. And once you do cystinostomy, if you convinced that you don't need to take out the bone flap, the brain is quite lax. If the brain is very lax after your surgery, why do you need to throw off the bone? You can keep the bone back. And then that becomes cystinostomy automatically. So, I mean, this is the way to go. This is the correct way to go. In fact, what you're doing, I completely agree with you. And this is the way to go. In fact, my failure in making cystinostomy to get accepted in the first, in the last five or six years was that I was a radical. I said, no decompression. I said, it's criminal. It, you okay. cannot do this. But <laughs> I think the way that you should do, because... I have many guys did this and then finally they said this is disaster because I tried to open system the whole brain came out and I had to close and then convert to decompressive hemicranial to me and come out. So yes, I agree I, because this is a, uh, you know, I started this after I did my vascular fellowship in Fujita with Professor Sano. So a guy who has just finished his neurosurgery to expect him to go and uh, uh, get into the system in a very, very tight brain is, uh, you know, almost unethical. It's not correct. So I agree to you, I completely agree with you that the way to go about it is to first start cystinostomy with decompression. And then as we progress, uh, if you can open the membrane of nilicus also with the guidance of somebody like you, and then you see that the brain is quite lax, and then we go ahead and uh, say that I'm keeping the bone flap as a floating flap. And uh, if that works out, fine. Then it becomes a system of me automatically. Okay. So I agree with you. I completely agree with you. Uh, okay. I, 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 before I turn over to Simon for a question, I'd like to stress to all the neurosurgeons and neurosurgical residents that they can come on this panel and ask the man Ipe, uh, the sister, and ask me. They can talk uh, to him face to face and ask a question. So I encourage you to go to the neurosurgical.tv slash studio HTML page to click on no, the link. People, click on the link and ask, come in. Link. People are asking me for a link. Okay, uh, go to the neurosurgical.tv studio page. Go to the main page of the website, neurosurgical.tv. Yeah. We and, and, and click on the studio page. One second. Okay. Studio. Yes. Okay. And, and, yeah. I encourage anyone watching uh, to go to the neurosurgical.tv studio page and right. to, to right. ask to come into the hangout right here with us and with everyone else to ask the man I a question about cystinoscopy. Okay, Wait, Simon, you, you had a question. Uh, thank you. I just have one very basic question. Uh, what was done prior to decompressive hemicraniotomy? Yeah, I mean, uh, one second, uh, Simon, uh, one second. Uh, I've just posted this on the, uh, on my, so people are asking me for a link. Yeah, I'm so, going to give it, I'm going to give it to you right now on your Facebook. Yeah, so I, I have just put it on and now Simon was asking me as to, Santosh would be doing it. Uh, Simon was asking me as to what was done prior to decompressing uh, Is that what your... Um, yes. Yes. Was, yes. Was that your question? Yes, that's my question. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't actually know because the decompressive hemicranic to me, decompressive hemicranic to me itself is a 110-year-old procedure. So, from the beginning of so-called modern neurosurgery, the decompression hemicranic has existed. And then a lot of people stopped believing. Say, for example, there was a paper from Jamie Cooper who said, who said that decompression hemicranic doesn't work at all. And then uh, people started saying that, no, it works in a certain amount of certain people 
although the morbidity and mortality is very high, it works in certain people and uh, things like that. So that's what uh, Roberto was saying. It took a long time for decompressing hemicrine to be, to be accepted back again. But I it see. is a surgery which has been going on for, you know, 100 and, 110, 115 years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a new surgery. So if you ask me what was prior to that, it is, prior, it is it's almost like asking what is prior to God. Mm -hmm. So decompressing hemicrinic to me, if you think that, you know, it was interesting that for tumors and even for aneurysms, people used to practice decompressing hemicrinic to me. Am I right, Roberto? Long time back before microsurgery yes. came, there were people who were doing decompressive hemicrinic to me for aneurysms and for tumors. So it is a very old surgery and it is a very simple surgery and it can be done by any, anybody. So that's the advantage of it. I see. Thank you. You know, one comment I'd like to make. Uh, I uh, in the United States, uh, as you know, there's a there's a there's a big medical legal problem with any new procedure. And I know as an ER physician, uh, when when they introduce thrombolytics, which are accept, accepted now uh, for M, for certain types of embolic MIs to dissolve the clot, uh, it was it's very difficult because. Physicians are are hesitant to adopt anything new uh, because of uh, getting sued uh, in the United States. That that, that occurs, uh, and I can remember talking to families before offering them thrombolytics. Uh, you'd have a guy in chest pain on the bed, and you'd be there and with your papers with a family explaining how you can't, why you should use it, why you you know with the the risk, etc. It's not easy to get something new, as you mentioned, accepted. You're absolutely right, John. So we had this problem when we started off in uh, Belfast, in, uh, in, in in Switzerland, when we started off in China, even in India we had a problem when we started it off. Uh, so how we overcame this problem is what I'm telling you right now. So it's a very simple thing. So decompression hemicranectomy is accepted for trauma. So we say we do a decompressive hemicranectomy as an additional procedure. Opening cisterns for any condition decreases intracranial pressure. That is, there are many papers on that. So we are doing we are doing an opening of cisterns along with decompressive hemicranectomy. Now, when we do that, the brain is lax, and then there is a clause in decompressive hemicranectomy that once you do uh, once you remove the subdural, once you do the procedure, after that, if the brain is lax, you can put the bone as a floating flap. So there's no cystinostomy. It's only a decompressive hemicranic to where I've opened the cisterns, and then my brain is lax, so I put the bone flap back. So it's it's not really a new procedure. But you see, actually, although it's a new procedure, I have to disguise it as something which is very old. You know, that's because we are all very rigid people. You know, most of the world, anything, as you said, the change is so important. I mean, change is so difficult. So I have to disguise it. In many places, I have to disguise this as a decompressive hemicranectomy, which is actually right. Nobody can find fault with it because you're asking them to do a large flap, decompressive hemicranectomy flap, and then asking them to open the dura just like the way you do open decompressive hemicranectomy, and then go into the base. The next step that you're doing it is already accepted for aneurysms and any other procedures that to go into the base and open the cisterns. Once you open the cisterns, if you're confident enough, you can go and open the membrane of reliquus also, and the brain is going to be lax. And once it is lax, it is an accepted thing that once the brain is lax, you don't have to throw out the bone flap. You can put the bone flap back again, and there, there you are. No cisternostomy, just a decompressive, modified decompressive hemicranectomy. That is how we got around this problem. Okay. Very. Do the Nepalese uh, medical students have any questions, Javan or Garab? Well, uh, now I don't have any questions. <laughs> okay, that's okay. No problem. Yeah. Javan, do you have any questions? Okay, Ro yes. Roberto, go okay. ahead. Go ahead, Roberto. Ipe, um, I agree completely with with you. Uh, um, many years ago. In, in aneurysm surgery, uh, I, I had operated many aneurysm in, in acute stage, and 
I see, uh, I, I saw the, the, the brain swelling, swelling brain, the, the blood, uh, and many neurosurgeons disagree with operate the aneurysm in acute, acute stage. But I had operated uh, a lot of them, and after I opened the, the cistern, uh, removed the clothes, uh, cleaned the LCR, uh, I, I, could, I, I could operate uh, the aneurysm uh, with no problem. And Absolutely. after that, the brain, I, 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 can, I can see the, the brain relaxed and, and I, I could uh, shut the, the craniotomy with no problem. Uh, this was my first concept in, in operate in acute aneurysm and remove completely the, the cloth of the, the, the LC, LCR and open the cistern. Um, I think this is the, the, the main example for me that the, we, we can operate in acute this, this kind of pathology uh, with, with bad brain and open the cistern um, and, and achieve a good surgery, a good recovery with very good brain. Um, and I think this is the most uh, seen to, to the trauma, the, the acute hemorrhagia in uh, subarachnoid hemorrhagia in aneurysm surgery, in, in vascular malformation surgery. Um, uh, I think this is the, 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 the most seems with the trauma and, and we can uh, achieve a good result, we, we can get a, a good result uh, opening, only opening the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean what Roberto said is, is spot on. Now we're going to discuss something called CSF shift edema. So now we have different types of edema which have been described in, uh, in the literature. And what applies for trauma till now, we, we used to think that it is the vasogenic or the cytotoxic edema. So we have mentioned, we have now, I mean, we have now described a new system of edema which we call the CSF shift edema already published. It's already published. I'll give you the link to this. So in subarachnoid hemorrhage and trauma, what exactly is happening and how does that produce that edema? And as Roberto said, many surgeons, uh, 30, 40 years back, many surgeons were never willing to go ahead and operate an aneurysm in, in the acute period. But now we all operate aneurysms in the acute period. Just imagine giving that to a resident. If you give that to a resident or a young neurosurgeon, it's going to mess that up because it's a very, very specialized thing. To go, to learn the anatomy, to go into the interoptic within seconds, open the cisterns and have the confidence to open it can be done only by experts. So it's the same case with systemostomy. So we have to start off, as Roberto said, Roberto is one of the pioneers who started doing acute aneurysms um, in the immediate uh, postictal phase. It's it's very difficult. It's almost as difficult as cystinostomy. Believe me, uh, all our aneurysms in Nepal, all the aneurysms are in the acute stage. And uh, unless you you are opening the cisterns, I mean, and this stands in good stead. This are our experience of cystinostomy stands in good stead for us because how much ever bad the brain is, we are able to open the cisterns, get a lax brain, and get into the get into the aneurysm. So I think uh, when we discuss the CSF shift edema as the second, I mean, as a third talk, we would be, uh, we would be discussing more on this and we'll be showing you a schematic diagram of what exactly CSF shift edema. And then probably we will look at the paper also as to what are our evidences for this thing.